right, I guess we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming to this panel uh, where we'll talk about multi-screen video. Um, my name is Sarah Barry James, and I'm a reporter with SNL Kagan. Um, we cover the financial side of the media and communication space. Um, I've been there about seven years now, um, so it feels like sort of a long time. But um, anyway, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Bonnie? Hi, my name is Bonnie Pan, and I oversee original programming for Yahoo and Yahoo Screen. Hi, my name is Chris Melisinos. I'm the Director of Corporate Strategy for Media and Entertainment at Verizon. Um, spent a lot of time in the media space, specifically video games, interactive entertainment uh, industries, and uh, happy to be here. I'm Alex Kish. Uh, I run business development and business affairs for Vivo. Uh, so that includes basically overseeing all our licensing and content acquisition and our distribution and global growth strategy. I'm Don Sperling. I oversee all the media platforms for the, actually it's the New York football giants, not New York Giants football, but um, <laughs> I, I oversee all uh, television, digital, radio, any, any media platform for the giants. Um, well, just given the timing of this event with uh, what's been going on in the industry, I thought maybe we could start um, sort of with one event that's been happening very recently, uh, the New Fronts. And so, um, Alex, uh, if you wanted to go first, you guys uh, recently announced at the New Friends that you would be inserting brand images into videos. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that works? Sure, yes. Yeah. So this is, uh, we announced a strategic partnership with a company called Myriad. Um, we're basically, it's technology that allows us to, uh, to do basically uh, dynamic product placement into videos uh, after they've been produced. So instead of just while in pre production, you know, having a, uh, you know, a billboard or a bottle of a soft drink or whatever it is, you can literally take the video after the fact and you can virtually insert things into the video. Um, so the first one we're, we just rolled out is an owl black video mm -hmm. uh, with, with Levi's where um, there are Levi's billboards on the walls of buildings uh, in the video. Um, so one of the great things about this is, you know, it, it allows for, if we have that campaign running for a period of time, you can theoretically have a second campaign with another brand. And whether it's a different billboard or a car or a cell phone or whatever it is, it also allows you to be um, more nimble in terms of localization. So whether that's globally, so maybe you'd have you know, a, a, an integration with Verizon in the US, you might have an integration with Vodafone in, in the UK where mm -hmm. you know, Verizon's not gonna be, be relevant. Um, you know, theoretically, you could see a time where you could even do that on a local basis uh, you know, within the US. Right. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're just kind of dipping our toe into it now, but. Uh, Does the artist have to authorize a brand to be inserted in, or like how much nego or cooperation is there with the artist on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, this is, you know, all done in close cooperation with the artist, with the record labels, the rights holders. Um, you know, so, I mean, any, similar to the way they would be involved in, in any kind of traditional product placement. Um, so they're, they're definitely on board from the get-go. Yeah, Myriad's a cool company. I remember the first time I worked on a story about them, they were doing um, product placement in uh, like syndicated or rerun content. And so a show that had run five years ago that had an ad for something that was cool five years ago would get a new product inserted to make it look like it wasn't quite so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it definitely solves a, you know, a particular problem as you see, uh, you know, brand integrations becoming uh, more more important as we move to an on-demand era and a skippable ad era. But but, you know, the flip side of that is then you you forever uh, kind of locked in that piece of content with that brand and that campaign. Um, so, you know, this this is sort of a solve for that. So if you've got a campaign that's going to be stale in six weeks' time, you can basically resurrect you know, that video for, for a new integration at some point. Yeah. 
Uh, Bonnie, you guys also recently had your new front presentation. Um, can you talk about what you guys announced there and how your video, video strategy is evolving? Sure. Um, we had a couple of big announcements just a few weeks ago at our new front. Um, the biggest being that we're moving into scripted programming. So we announced two half hour comedy shows that will live on Yahoo, one with Paul Feig called Other Space and one with Mike Tolan um, called Sin City Saints. And it's a really exciting time for Yahoo to be moving into scripted because we believe that we have this really awesome opportunity to connect creators with our massive audience in a really unique and digital way in an experience that other people can't at the, at the current moment. Additionally, we announced a partnership with Live Nation um, where we'll be streaming a live concert every single day on Yahoo. Um, so the combination of live programming with the scripted um, is a really big investment into kind of creating and connecting creators, whether they're musicians or comedians or directors with our massive audience. So right. it's exciting. Yeah, um, there's obviously been a big push into original programming by a lot of different uh, uh, new media companies. And I, I guess one thing that for both that's true for um, you know both Yahoo and Vivo is that traditionally I see you guys as um, more of an aggregator of content and then a distributor of that content that you have aggregated. You guys have so many sites. You guys have so many eyeballs. Um, but now there's this, and you guys, I think, announced some original programming as well. And so in terms of that balance between uh, creating, developing, and then distributing and licensing, can you talk about how you guys see that balance evolving? Is there, you know, can you do both? Is it a all rising tides lifts all yeah. boats? <laughs> Um, we definitely, I think, subscribe to the, we subscribe to the notion that we can do both. We have a massive distribution engine with our front page still being, you know, one of the most powerful destinations on the internet. Um, and additionally, we, we have this, this idea that we can personalize and use our personalization engine to create a funnel that's unique to your audience. So some of the changes that you've seen under Marissa's leadership is really investing in that technology that brings personalization to the forefront on Yahoo in a way that we've never been able to do before. So while um, you may enjoy an original series, we also can kind of personalize it and pull the best clips from SNL to kind of create this funnel for you that's curated based on your behaviors and our, our data stream. So it is for us, it needs to be a, a perfect mix. Right. Um, Alex, do you have any thoughts on that sort of that balance between distributing music videos that you're known for, but then also creating content that people want to tune in for, sort of? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's similar for us, right? I mean, I think it, it's it's we're really trying to do both. The the catalog of licensed videos is probably still our bread and butter. I mean, we have you know close to a hundred thousand premium videos and 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 growing, uh, but we've also actually to date created, I think, 2,000 pieces of original content. They've been viewed collectively about a billion times. So it's something we've, we've begun doing, um, you know, shortly after we launched about four, four and a half years ago. Um, and we've been when sort of expanding it to, uh, while, we'll, while we'll continue to do uh, really performance-based and artist-based programs, live events, concerts, um, we're moving more into you know what I call uh, music lifestyle. So all our programming still has music at the core of it, music running through it in some way. Um, but you know we're seeing it's it's an opportunity for us to develop um, you know a bit more of a distinctive voice to grow the Vivo brand. Um, it also gives marketers out there something to kind of take hold of and, and have some ownership over. Right. So. You know, we see it works really well together, especially to the extent that um, you know we can use one piece of original content and kind of tie it into a set of music videos. So we have a show called Lyric Lines, for instance, which is um, Tommy Wooldridge, this kind of awkward 20-something-year-old, goes on college campuses and tries to pick up girls solely using lyrics from from songs. So you know we'll we'll focus on a particular artist. We'll do all Justin Bieber lyrics for for one program, and you know it's a perfect run into the next Justin Bieber uh, preview or, or vice versa. So it sort of 
taking a taking a chapter from television in a way, right? And using you know one hit show to kind of lead into something else. Um, but but we see that you know the two kind of work hand in glove. That sounds like a terrible idea. Baby, 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 <laughs> baby. <laughs> Want to go out on a date or something? Someone like that. That's going to. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of luck. But, uh, <laughs> that's what makes it so interesting. That's what makes it fun. <laughs> Not that I know the lyrics to Justin Bieber songs, obviously. Um, well, uh, to just kind of switching gears really fast, um, Chris, Verizon got a lot of attention recently with its acquisition of Intel and the cloud TV service. And so if you could kind of update us on what's been going on there and what we should be excited about and watching out for. I'm sorry, what? No, no. no. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so uh, Verizon recently uh, completed the acquisition of the Intel Media Group. Um, they had been developing a platform, which you may have heard of, uh, that was designed to look at um, traditional linear programming in a different way um, in a world that's moving progressively towards OTT type of services. And a lot of it was about um, how do you go ahead and solve for some of the problems that consumers have in terms of forgetting uh, to watch programs they recorded or forgetting to record those programs. And they've built um, uh, an excellent technology base and um, consumer experience that we found very compelling. You know, at, at Verizon, you know, uh, being involved in both the the wireless side, right, with 110 million subscribers and being involved in the wireline side with, you know, five plus million in the Fios footprint, these are worlds that Verizon knows very well, right? And as the world is changing and we're finding both sides of that business not in conflict but trying to find their fit with each other, emerges this opportunity in the OTT space. So we saw this as uh, uh, an opportunity to bring some of that expertise in-house and allow us to start charting our course with regard to next generation OTT services. Is that considered like a future proofing move so that if someone wants to you know, mm. watch Fios TV, they can. If someone wants to subscribe to Fios Internet, they can. And then use the OTT service. And I mean, however they want to get the content. Sure. So without getting into specifics, um, what I will say is that it gives us the ability to make sure that we are addressing where the market is moving to, mm -hmm. right? And also being able to meet the demands and the requirements of next generation users, mm -hmm. right? Who may be spending more time connected, more time engaged in this type of activity, less time in traditional modes of consumption. Mm -hmm. So it gives us the opportunity to better understand that market, better understand the needs of an evolving consumer, and make sure we're providing the services that they actually require. Great. Um, Don, you're sort of, um, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't going to phrase it quite that way. I hadn't decided how I was going to phrase it. And, um, but uh, yeah, with the rest of the panelists, I sort of think of them very much more n new media in a way in terms of the questions that I was writing for them. And then for you, I think yeah, I've, live sports is always touted as the thing that's keeping people hooked on the big screen, on their TV, in the living room, that's driving you know, linear tune-in. and um, So can you talk about what makes um, live sports different than any other type of content in some ways? Yeah, well, we're, we're obviously, a, you know, along with the other teams and other sports teams in, in, in all the leagues, we're in a very unique but great position as we have this unbelievably loyal fan base. And what we do is we have this week-long story every week, which is built in. So what we take advantage of with all of our platforms, and you know, mostly actually digital and social, is we have this build that starts the day after the game, and you know, you, it looks back a little bit, but then you start to move forward. And through our digital properties and through social, we utilize all of our content, we utilize you know, all of our information, our editorial, to really drive the interest day to day, and then that filters in and that trades off through television, back to digital, and so forth, through editorial. And we build and build and build, and we're telling this week-long story, and we're creating you know, personalities and storylines. And what, we, what we're able to do that other, that maybe even the ESPNs and the NFL Networks and the NBCs and, uh, cannot do is 
we give them we give our fans the access mm -hmm. because we are the team and the player and we're there every single day so we're driving access we're driving lifestyle okay we're what we're doing is we're providing them with yes analysis and and all that because we do have expertise in that however we're also showing a side that sort of drives interest to a wider audience, builds our audience throughout the week, and then obviously culminates in the game. And we, and we use a lot of companies you know, that help us out with that. You know, we use companies like Mass Relevance and Yinscam and New Tech, who's here, that provide some of the you know, applications for that. But that's what we do on a week-to-week -week basis. And you know, our, uh, our website, our, our digital and social just is growing leaps and bounds. Our numbers are amazing and, you know, we, we really uh, we kind of thrive in that. Yeah, even though I associate you guys with, um, you know, linear tune in, like I said, um, you guys are obviously hugely active online and, and really engaging your fans on all platforms. So can you talk about some of the digital and social strategies that you use for the second screen right. experience? Well, there's really, we look at it as two. We, we look at it the, the things we do for our fans that are on mobile, that are on tablet, that are out of town and so forth during the course of the week. And then we have our in-game during the same. So the NFL, you know, and, and the networks have the rights to the game. So we, we don't, that window, from 12, p from 12 noon through you know, 11 at night, that you, you, we don't show highlights, footage, so forth. However, what we can do through, through our mobile app, like for instance at the stadium, we're giving our fans at the stadium, uh, you know, we work with the uh, Yinscam, which does a, our, our, our mobile app, we're giving them two, two separate angles that they can't get from the networks or even on our video screens because we also produce the game in the stadium and so forth. We're giving them customized service so they know which, you know, which exits are there, what the traffic is. We, we'll tell them, it, you know, we'll, we'll, we try to understand our fans in the sense that, you know, maybe they like a certain kind of food and where the shorter lines are. That's all building right now, the customization. Uh, we provide in, in the stadium, out of town scores, fantasy, uh, you know, scoring drives, you know, leaders. We're constantly flooding our fans with stats and information because even though we don't have a problem selling tickets, we, we don't want our fans to say, well, you know what, I can enjoy this at the comfort of home and get all the information I want with my 16-inch screen sitting on my couch and so forth. So I can, I can come to the stadium, I can enjoy the game live, the vibrant atmosphere, the linear atmosphere, and then at the same time use my second screen to keep up with everything that I do that I, that I do during the week and that I could do at home or an away game. That's interesting, the balance between the live event, the live broadcast, and then the second screen. Right. So. And we look at it like that. It really is the second screen. Because in the, the, as we, we were discussing beforehand, you, it's going to be a long, long time before that live event is replaced on a large screen. Not, not a lot of people want to watch sports on a small screen. But what they want to do is put the layer on top of it. They want to find, they want stats and information. They want to talk. They want to tweet. They want to find out what people are saying. They want to do that during the timeouts or, or so forth. So we make sure that we, we're providing enough information and enough content that kind of gives that thirst, like, like warm-ups, like locker room, the things that they can't get, the access that only we can provide. Right. You mentioned uh, some data about how many people watched the Super Bowl right. live and how many streamed it. Can you say that yeah. again? Yeah. You know, it, we, we were just out at uh, the SVG uh, Chairman's Retreat Conference out in uh, before NEB out in Vegas, and we had a venture capital guys come up and talk about where the money is going and what, where they're investing. and that. The companies are emerging, and the money is still going into good, you know, high-quality video, HD, 4K, 8K. Companies are emerging, you know, all kinds of technology for that. That's still a good business because live sports, the the event, Super Bowl was watched by 110 million people. It's the largest audience of TV in the, ever in the world. The amount of people that watched it streaming was about 435,000. That's a less than a half a percent of that and he said at that growth his grandchildren's grandchildren so the idea here and I don't think it's a surprise to anybody it's not like people are going to be watching big sporting events on on a small screen but i think the onus is upon providers like us on this you know to give that second screen experience that you can only get with certain you know uh, ownership and content providers
Great. Um, Bonnie, uh, since Yahoo is an active player on so many platforms now, um, and sort of speaking to what Chris was talking about there, or, I'm sorry, Don was talking about there in terms of dividing, you know, what's on which screen and everything like that. Um, does each device require different content, or can everything just be ported? Like, I can, if I'm watching Game of Thrones, I'm watching it on my TV, I'm watching it on my tablet, I'm watching it on my phone, so on, so on. Yeah, um, different than a live event, actually. Um, I think while everything can be ported, and you can watch it either on our Apple TV app, or the mobile app, or on our desktop screen site, I have a um, really strong belief that the future is going to what we call device parting. When you think of traditional networks and how they day part programming and kind of lead into prime time, if you think about how people use their devices during the day, standing on the subway platform, maybe I want a quick clip on my mobile phone. And then I get to work and I'm maybe eating lunch at my desk, which I'm pretty sure everyone in this room probably does. <laughs> um, including myself and everyone here, but you're like, oh, let me catch up on something um, that's happened throughout the day, or you're checking um, a finance show, and then kind of really taking and changing that behavior into the living room at night, where you're watching a live event, or you want that lean back experience, or you introduce a second screen. And so this idea that we literally are programming by device rather than time of day, and that the device is replacing the time of day, so. And if I can add to that too, I mean, this, it, back in the interactive entertainment space, video game space, right? we used to look at mobile games back in the early aughts, late 90s as micro boredom, right? How do you mm -hmm. kill periods of micro boredom, right? Yeah. I'm standing there, I've got a few minutes to do this, and what I observe, I'm sure we all have these anecdotes and these, you know, these observations in our own lives. I have three kids, a high school, middle schooler, and an elementary school. So I've got, wow. right, this whole spectrum of technology consumption. And uh, my son, uh, last summer, Disney was promoting their Teen Beach movie, right? Mm -hmm. Disney does musicals every summer, and they do a great job with them, great for, you know, for kids and everything. And this kid, it was, you know, he was like a dog with a bone. He's like, when is this thing on? When is this thing on? And he comes into our room at like 7.30 on a Saturday morning and goes, oh, I just watched Teen Beach movie. And I'm like, all right, well, which one of your sisters did you wake up to go downstairs at 7.30 on a Saturday? Because now I've got to deal with pissed off people in the house. And uh, he goes, no, no, I just watched on my iPod. Yeah. And so to him, it was about the fidelity of contact, not the, the fidelity of content that mattered. It mattered to him to have access to the thing he'd been waiting for from the device that was most accessible to him, mm -hmm. right? So it's the old adage, yeah. like, what's the greatest camera in the world? Right. The camera that you have when you need a camera. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how good the rig is at home if you don't have it with you. And this is the world that we are raising our children in, mm -hmm. right? Where they, it, they demand this kind of consumption. It's different for live because it's event. And whether we go to the stadium or we go to the living room to be together to watch those events, for almost everything else, it is about fitting that media into our lives as we move from device to device. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, from a content perspective, from a venue perspective, from an artist perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, ensure that we have platforms in place that meet not only the democratization of content, right, right. Or, or, and the commoditization of access, right? And so these are really, really big problems that are, that are evolving at a scale that's so far beyond where most companies are comfortable working with. Right. And I'd say collectively, we've all done a pretty good job of meeting the demand, but there's still a lot of work to do. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on no. the but it touches no. so, here, here. so much of my, my <laughs> stuff no. outside of Verizon that I've been building up towards. So. Well, that's interesting, Sorry. too, because yeah. it's, I mean, for your, your son, um, excited about Teen Beach movie, which was great, by the way. It was a great movie. Um, Justin Bieber and Teen Beach. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a pretty thing. Um, but, I mean, it's interesting to think about how all of those different platforms would have built up into generating that anticipation. Like, was he watching Disney Channel and, like, the ads on the, you know, the network actually created demand so that finally, finally, when it was available, he could watch it on his, on whatever screen he had closest to him and it wouldn't wake his sisters or whatever. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, well, um, well, Chris, if we wanted to... <laughs> Go to your next question. It was uh, about the Redbox Instant platform and sort of what's been going on there. Sure. So I mean, it very much the same way that we've looked at, um, you know, the the world of OTT and this emerging content. Um, 
again, as much as I've said what we are doing with regard to Intel Media, it's the same sort of uh, approach with Redbox Instant, which is to understand, better understand, how a valued uh, brand like Redbox translates into this OTT uh, market space, right? And how do you go ahead and start bridging both the, uh, start bridging the physical space into an always on, always accessible OTT space? Um, so we're still working on the platform, right? It's, it's, um, it's available on you know, everything from PlayStation 4 down to your phones today and a bunch of different uh, you know, uh, TV streaming boxes. So it's still something that we um, think is valuable and something that we're going to continue um, seeing where it sits within the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, I have nothing else to say. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, you get no more questions. <laughs> um, no, actually. Um, one thing that uh, we all have in common up here is that we all need to monetize the content that we're creating and delivering and distributing. And so um, if you guys even just wanted to go straight down the line in terms of talking about advertising in different ways and all of the different touch points maybe that you guys have with your um, fans, consumers, users, uh, viewers, and whatnot, um, and sort of the whether ads can be, in the same way that we talked about content, can it be just ported, the same content can be ported to different places, can the ads be ported to different places, do we need to specialize the ads or um, make them more interactive or do something to them so that they're specialized for each platform, and how far are we in that effort to actually um, maximize the value of ad space on the different platforms. So Bonnie, you want to start? Yeah, it's a great question and something we think about all the time, um, living in an ad-supported world at Yahoo. Um, I think there's that is a huge white space where the development and the monetization, like to your um, example earlier at the beginning of the panel and the partnerships that people are able to do and really look at how are we bringing content to these audiences on different devices, how are we, um, I think there's, how are we interacting with it, how are we also making clear that they're, it's actually an advertisement, which is, I think, something that when you think about content creators matching them with audience, you want to have and continue the trust of the audience while not making the ad invasive, but still letting them know it's an ad. Um, so for Yahoo, we look at a couple of different ways. We just um, launched a few digital magazines where the idea there is that it's a very deep passion point filled to your it's a very deep experience filled to your passion. So for example, Yahoo Travel was announced at our new front and Yahoo Food was launched and Yahoo Tech with David Pogue. Um, and what you're seeing is this very deep and rich experience where you're bringing in the user and they're having multiple formats of entertainment and advertising happens to be one of them, but it's not invasive. And that's something that we're trying to solve in the video landscape and expect that as we push into live programming and scripted content, you will, um, we just, everyone, the whole industry needs to evolve in terms of, of how we're serving that content and how people are engaging with it while maximizing the ROI for the advertiser as well. Um, people are not adverse to advertising, they're adverse to be being abused by it, yeah. right? They're adverse to be being bludgeoned by advertising and so it's important to remember that when we are looking at the different screens and the different interaction space and the possibility space that content sits within, it's how do we most effectively advertise in a contextual manner on the device that's appropriate. Last night, again, another example. We missed recording 24. So I went to Fox Now on my tablet, streamed it to uh, the TV, and they showed the same three commercials in every break once they showed over the same commercial again. twice back to back at 90 seconds per spot. So what it did from a brand perspective was make me not want to engage in that product or platform. 
because it, it's like how many times do I need to see this, this? And I won't even tell you what the ad is because it irked me so, so much, right? So what we have to do is be- the Verizon ad, by the way. Yeah. No, no, Verizon ads are fantastic. No, no, no. Um, no, no. And let, let's be honest, right? We can all do a better job, right, with regard to advertising. There is one word that I will tell you that is missing in so much of the type of advertising that's happening in this space, and it's empathy. Right? It's, it's having empathy for the viewer. And everyone talks about Apple being the pinnacle of marketing and everything else. And their, their commercial that they did over the holiday break called Misunderstood, one of the best ads I've, I've ever seen because it said nothing about the product and everything about why you'd want to own one. So it played entirely to the empathy side of the, of the coin. Right? We don't necessarily need to over rotate that far. But what we need to do is understand that people's time is their currency. Right? And what you're asking to spend in watching your ad is important. And so we have to get better at engaging them correctly, contextually, making sure it's relevant not only to the person, but to the device. And so to that end, we are also examining the type of platforms that we put in place to start bringing that kind of advertising and opportunity to this mixed content world of, of linear and wireless and OTT. To add to your 24 point, it's something that we actually were just talking about before our scripted announcements when we looked at how are we approaching the advertising community, how many, it's, it's big decisions you're making, right? But to, to the point, I wonder is, is the onus on the distributor to make sure that they're not putting to two ads back to back sure. or is it on the advertiser because at a certain point it's out of your control I think that right? what's happened to right it's an incredibly yeah. complex the advertising world today is incredibly complex from a, from a um, platform perspective SSPs and DSPs and everybody in the middle so when I see things like that what it says to me is there's a failure in analytics yeah. there's a failure in understanding who I am and if I'm doing this from a tablet there's no shortage of of kind of you know, breadcrumb trails in terms of what I do, who I am, what I like, right? So it really is, I think, we're in the infancy of those type of systems and, and the, the type of um, mechanisms we have to understand who's actually on the other side of that screen. Mm -hmm. We have this opportunity that these platforms provide that a television cannot, mm -hmm. right? And so we have to get better at understanding who that consumer is at the end of the pipe. Yeah. And if we can do that, consumers will be more willing to open up who they are to them because everything you give them will be relevant to them. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, I, I mean, I agree what, with uh, what both these guys have said. I mean, I think you know, there is, to Bonnie's point, it, it's, it's a big white space. There's both a tremendous number of, of, of challenges and also a huge number of opportunities. So, you know, the, the Marriott technology is just one example of you know, a whole slew of things that kind of uh, lay ahead for us. I think the, the, the real challenge is sort of striking that very delicate balance. And, and I mean, Chris, you, you spoke to this. I think, you know, for Vivo, we, we like to say, you know, we, we serve three constituents, three masters that we really have to, to balance to do, uh, to do the job right, which is, you know, one, we're serving the brand partners, the marketers, because we need to please them in order to keep the lights on. But at the same time, we're serving, um, you know, the, the user, um, and then we're also serving, you know, our, our artist constituencies. And if you, if any one of those elements falls out of balance, we fail. So, you know, if, if, um, if we're doing any kind of, you know, native advertising, which is sort of a big hot button word these days, but to the extent we're doing brand and entertainment or integrations or product placements, then it starts to become, you know, just smell a little funny and, and you know, the, the user can really sniff that out and that's going to backfire on us. And we have to be mindful, to your point earlier, of, you know, we are, uh, you know, deeply uh, enmeshed with the artist and uh, content community, so we have to at all times be extremely respectful of them, be mindful of, uh, you know, endorsement issues, and, you know, keep, keep those lines kind of very clear. So it is, you know, very, uh, something you have to be extremely careful, I think, to strike that right balance. Um, so I think, I think we're all getting there. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity ahead, and we're, we're just scratching the surface. But to Chris's point, the, 
you know, the, the level of interactivity, the amount of data that's out there to mine um, creates just an, a huge opportunity to, to do a much better job. At the end of the day, to, uh, as much as you know, consumers don't love advertising, if you can make the advertising that much more relevant to them and so you don't get you know, 30 of the same ad over and over and what they do get speaks to them, you know, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot less painful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, this area for us, for us is obviously evolving constantly. The way traditionally the giants would sell adver advertising and sell our sponsorships, our salespeople would package everything. So if you buy the giants for the larger, uh, you, buy, you come in, you get in-game in stadium, so you get video boards, LEDs, you get television inventory, radio inventory, and then digital kind of was like at traditionally before and because most of the salespeople really didn't understand it, was kind of thrown in. Yeah, well, and, and then it was left up to us to skin the, skin the site, put up the banner ads, do the pre-rolls, and whatever. This is evolving now. What we've done recently is our group has then gotten in front of this now, and we've created sort of quadrants where we've, we've gone and said, this is how you're going to come in and, and advertise here. When you get this, you can sponsor, you know, at certain tiers. You can come in path to the draft, training camp, the season. And so we've split it up into that ways. And we have certain rules because our fan base, again, is a little different. We're not having people or who might be interested in a certain concert or a certain show that you have in one time. We have people that are just the same group, hopefully growing a little wider, that are coming in. So we're very careful as to not upset that base because they're season ticket holders, they pay money, so forth. So no pre-roll is over 15 seconds. Okay, we don't have anything that's too obtrusive. Everything has to be integrated because you're actually doing a disservice to the sponsor if you have something that's standalone, our viewers will look away. They're, they're there for the Giants. So we'll take any of our sponsorship and integrate it with our colors, with our logos, with our brand, with our players, and then it's all of a sudden it's easier for our, for our fans to accept it, and then it actually elevates the sponsor or the advertiser. Oh, oh wow, they're, they're immersed, they're giants, they're, they're part of the family. Right. So that really becomes an important part, and you really have to stop and analyze everything, and you really have to, you really have to police it, because in a way, we're our group and I, you know, we're the art, you know, we're the judges of the brand. We protect the brand even from our own people. Right. Okay, because our sponsorship group, you know, they're they're desperate to close the deal, make the deal, you know, get the commission, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. And we have to say, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. You can't bring in green colors on our site when the, when the site is, you know, blue and red and trimmed this way. I mean, there's just a lot in that sense. But again, it is what, it's ever evolving and we're always open to what the new technology can offer us in terms of, or if, or if we'll do photo, uh, if we'll do a, it, we'll do a photo uh, file and we'll have like 20 photos. So every fifth photo, up for a few seconds will be maybe the advertiser branded with the Giants or so, yeah. or so forth. So in, in the sense that we're trying to integrate it, that's the way we look at it. That's really interesting. And because and, I, was, I was thinking as um, you guys were talking about all of the potential pitfalls, you know, especially as political advertising gets underway and, you know, certain artists are very active on one side or the other and how that would all play out. But it, you know, it's very interesting to hearing how the NFL and the Giants in particular, you know, protect, you know, are very careful about that. And so, um, Don, just continuing on, and this is just purely my own ignorance, um, can you talk about how for in the, within the NFL, do the different teams have a lot of autonomy when it comes to deciding that kind of stuff, or is that all, you know, relegated or regulated by the higher ups? There actually are certain rules that the NFL has in terms of footage use or game or the windows and things like that. But the one thing that's different than MLB and NBA, which really control the team sites, we are, we are in full control of our content and our editorial. Interesting. Okay? I mean, uh, there's now the, which I won't go into, but the NFL, there's this NFL Now that just came out. So we're, we, we have to provide, which is actually not that big a deal for us because we do so much content and provide so much on our, on our sites and social that we'll have enough for the NFL to, to absorb and so forth. But they provide the back end. So they're, they're providing the infrastructure, you know, we had, you know, everybody had their own company that, you know, that, that built their back end and built the infrastructure. Now the NFL does that, which is actually makes it very easy. Mm -hmm. They get a certain amount of banner ad space and a certain amount of 
of, of rotation and on inventory and so forth. But we really, it's up to us, to, uh, we design and do all the editorial and create all the content. And yes, if they have content that we like, we'll put it up if it's relevant. Relevancy is the big thing. You're talking about relevancy, you're talking about access. And that's what really is the justification for anything, you know, in terms of editorial, in terms of video, in terms of photos. It has to be relevant and we control that. So that's an advantage of being a team in the NFL that you are able to control your website, control your, you know, your, your, your Twitter and your social and everything like that. And we're doing, you know, we actually are doing right now, we, we, we started it a year ago. We, there's a company, Snappy TV, that um, works with CBS and NBC mm -hmm. and, and the NFL. And what it is, it's your, um, you can tweet out, it's cloud-based. You know, our, usually when our, let's say, training camp, and this is not for game stuff, you can't use footage, but for training camp practice, which our fans are, can't get enough of, you know, writers would tweet out, uh, Eli Manning just hit Cruz with an in route, and so, you know, written, maybe a photo, possibly. We actually are shooting it through a live view camera, okay, and then, tweet, and then tweeting it out virtually in real time within seconds. Mm -hmm. So a writer may write that, but we'll actually tweet that play out within seconds of when it happened. Whereas before, we'd have to shoot the practice, come in, edit it, and three hours later, we'd have the highlights of the practice. Right. So we're, we're doing, we do this for pregame, for warm-ups before the game. We're doing this in and around, all week long and in and around the game. So we're providing our fans with a voyeur look at what's going on at the facility while, you know, or the players fooling around and hanging out, walking back into the locker room, whatever it is. We're giving them that in almost in real time now. Right. So, um, well, uh, Chris, I wanted to talk to you about gaming since I think that's something you know a lot about, yes. and um, kind of both the opportunities that that presents um, for Verizon and and the online media space in general, and sort of. Um, the interactivity that it introduces and are, is and how it's sort of influencing the content that's um, you know being produced for just normal t television consumption and you know sort of that it creates this social atmosphere of interactive space. So, any thoughts? Who's a gamer in the room? You, don't be bashful. You all are. Put your hands up. It's, everyone here has at least an Xbox and just someone that has one, right? How many people have a smartphone of some sort? Okay, the rest of you didn't raise your hands, you're liars. Um, everybody has one, you've all either played Candy Crush or Clash of Clans or Solitaire or Tetris or something. Everybody is a gamer and we typically talk about, well, it's this sleeping, dormant giant. It isn't sleeping and it's not dormant. It may not be directly in line with frontline linear television or it may still bubble beneath the surface. But for the very first time in the history of content, right? We have the first people who grew up with computers in the house, raising people with computers in the house. First time, right? So we like to say from the gaming industry is that gamers are raising gamers for the very first time. And when we look at these numbers of people who are watching game-related content, now it's going to start to have an effect on traditional linear content. I look at these rising sort of networks like Machinima and Twitch, right? You may have heard of Twitch, I was just trying to, I wasn't ignoring you, my apologies for the appearance of the studio, I was trying to actually pull up my Sony PlayStation app, which allows me to go ahead and stream FIFA from my PlayStation 4 live to a service that anybody in the world can then watch me playing FIFA from my living room. And Sony's generated somewhere, somewhat upwards of 300 million hours of programming so far, some crazy, crazy number of, uh, uh, of programming against this. Um, as I said, when you look at networks like Machinima with 200 million unique subscribers, Twitch with 45 million unique subscribers, watching an average of 90 minutes of video game related footage and programming per day, it's astonishing, right? The, the question is, when do we start to see this kind of collision? We're starting to see it, right? We're starting to see um, you know, uh, sitcoms like Big Bang Theory that appropriate nerdry content, which you know, those of us that grew up with it kind of go, oh, well, that's cute that you made an individual stereotype out of each one of these. I happen to love the, the program anyway, right? Um, 
the influence of interactivity on static content or linear content um, is actually going to be, I think, deafening over the next few years in terms of the impact it's going to have and how it's going to have to uh, change and be malleable to meet the demand of interactive consumption. And that's what we want to do, right? We want to be with our friends and be where action is happening and stamp ourselves into the experience. And so I think it's going to have a permanent and irreversible impact on the type of content we make moving forward. And that comes from gameplay, right? Mm -hmm. um, so big fan of gaming. And uh, we're, we have to do, uh, we have to see how it's going to change uh, uh, all forms of media moving forward. I mean, do you think that that convergence is being enabled now that, you know, a, a CDN like Machinima has been acquired by Disney and they, or, wait, are they Time Warner? I'm blanking. I'm getting all of my CDN acquisitions and investments confused. But anyway, in terms of like taking someone like Pew Pie? Pie. PewDiePie? PewDiePie. PewDiePie. PewDiePie and like bringing him into a mainstream media company. Okay. I, clearly watch terrible Disney Channel movies, but do not <laughs> watch That's okay. PewDiePie. Um, so, I mean, th is that convergence happening now that like major brands are sort of catching on sort of and, and acquiring these things, investing in them? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely think that is, that is true. And, and what's happening is in the case of companies like Machinima where um, other companies are taking first run properties and deciding that they're going after uh, an audience who is tuned to interactivity to launch new properties like, you know, whether it's, you know, Terminator anim animated series or now you have this, this halo work being done with Spielberg and they're trying right. to figure out where it's going to fit, right? We're, we're seeing kind of this collision of both sides of, of the media space. For the longest time, you know, traditional movie makers thought that, you know, video games were just, well, we'll just throw you know garbage at it, and we'll create something with the title, and it'll sell, and it'll prop up the movie, right? And today we're kind of finding the reverse of that, um, where people are looking to towards gaming as a principal form of interactivity, um, so specifically in the Gen Z space and and younger uh, Gen X or Gen Y. Of course, there's some Gen Xers like myself who have 42 game consoles at home uh, and travel with the game console with them all the time, um, right? It, it's th this movement that has occurred is, is not going, it, it's not going back. And so we're trying, there isn't a single company of substance that is building media in, in a vertical, right? Anybody that looks at a property, go back to Disney. They don't look at creating something that is just going to be a TV movie. It's movies and web interstitials and mobile components and interactive games and movies and musicals and all these other things that happen. It is, it is transmedia um, property or transmedia thought in all of the IP that they create. It is the way we are going to consume content. We have to meet people in all the vectors of consumption in order to engage them and keep the brands in front of them, right? keep a value proposition in front of them. Gaming is a huge piece of it. It's one that I think is less known within traditional linear content, but it will be unavoidable and you won't be able to ignore it pretty soon. Does that transmedia approach mean that only the bigger companies can afford to play in that space if they need to Absolutely have not. all those? Absolutely not. We talked about this before, right? It's the commoditization of technology, right? And the democratization of access that allows anybody from anywhere in the world now ostensibly to create content that meets a mass market. Look at the biggest selling independent game in history, Minecraft. Anybody? Minecraft? Everyone knows what Minecraft is, right? You've heard it or seen it. The guy that created Minecraft started on the forums that I stood up in 2000 called javagaming.org. This guy had been making games for 12 years before he hit on Minecraft. But what allowed him to create the most successful independent game in history? Access to cheap or free tools, access to a massive community on a global basis and have a direct conversation with them. They took on his cause and built this empire with him. Right? And the benefit of doing that is twofold. One is that you get the economies of scale without having to pay in the economics. And the other piece of that is that you have all the people that participated in the growth feeling that they own it. And if they feel some ownership in your growth, they will police it better than you can. They will defend it better than you can. They'll call you out when you do bad stuff, bad stuff right? So it keeps you honest as well. So Again, we're just beginning to understand the impact that a global audience can have on this. And I'll leave you one last thought, and then I'll get off the game thing. Uh, another friend of mine created a game called IDARB, if anyone's heard of this. It's a pound IDARB. IDARB stands for It Draws a Red Box. 
So a friend of mine, Mike, up at Other Oceans, created, uh, posted to Facebook and said, guys, I created this red box. And this is what it does. It just bounces. What else should it do? And so people just started tweeting and, and responding to him. This seems to be the next big independent game ever. I mean, it is all over every game press website because the community built it with him. Right? They're accessing a pool of people who want to see themselves reflected in the things that they play. Crowdsourcing. Right? Yeah, it is absolute crowdsourcing game design. Right? It's astonishing. It's awesome. Right? And we think there's a big opportunity for us in the space as well. Yeah, I mean, th that was a major um, talking point at the upfronts for the actual broadcast networks this week is letting or having the audience feel like they're making an impact, being heard, you know, That's right. having influence and yeah. interesting. Um, well, I think we have about 10 minutes left. So if there are any audience questions, um, please feel free. There's a mic that I see right there, but. I can hear you. <laughs> Although I think for recording purposes, they want you to use the mic. Right. But I can repeat it if you. Stand up here. Um, I guess this kind of segues off of what you were just talking about, uh, Chris, uh, and, the, and the movie to game interactivity uh, element. If you look recently at some of the some of the mobile games that have been released, like uh, Iron Man Three and also like the Amaz Amazing Spider-Man Two, like some of these mobile games have been released to coincide with with movie releases. Do you think that Going forward, um, the goal of, of releases like that are to drive moviegoers to download the games, or do you think the goal is to drive um, uh, some of the the you know the op in the opposite direction to drive kind of the the people who are downloading the game to go see the movie? It's like, what do you think are the 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 potential uh, monetization uh, potential from from those from that from that part? Sure. So I think the the real opportunity it serves both sides of that, but I think more importantly, what it does is it ensures that you are delivering a quality experience, whether it is a movie or a game, for the IP. Because it's not about Spider-Man the movie or Spider-Man the game, it's about Spider-Man the property. It's about all the canon that's been built up in there. It's about the love that people have for this character. And consumers are smart, right? So you'll be able to fool them every once in a while by slipping in a piece of garbage that has a good license on it. But if it's not a good game in its own right, they'll call you out on it. Likewise, if it's not a good movie, they'll call you out on it. So the goal here then is to make sure that that IP crosses the transoms to the different uh, forms of consumption that people have for media. Right? So I don't. Th I think they both serve each other, but most importantly, both of those things are serving Spider-Man the property. Do you think there's more monetization potential from from the game, like you know, in-app in -app purchases that people can? That's a free game; they can pay for things through in-app purchases. Do you think there's more monetization potential from that or from the actual? you know, movie ticket purchasing. Sure, so I think it depends on the property. I think that certain games or products lend themselves to um, long-term monetization through microtransaction um, versus going to see a movie, right? Movie is typically a once or twice event, and then you have syndication rights, and then you have distribution rights for uh, media and, and digital. So you, there's a well-known and well-understood kind of uh, trail for that in the in-game monetization and the micro-monetization side. It's not as well understood, but if it's done correctly, it can be absolutely astronomical in terms of uh, revenue potential for a company. Absolutely. Thanks. So go, the trick, though, you can't beat people over the head with it. If people feel like they're being taken advantage of, then you've squandered all your goodwill for the property across any of those vectors. right? So we have to be respectful of the people that play these games and make sure that we are giving them real value for the money and time that they're dedicated to your property. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yes? This is a question for Bonnie or somebody else who might want to pick it up. So we talked about personalization. Uh, do you have any instances of personalization that was actually well received? You know, it can be hard and tricky sometimes, and if it's, if it's not you know, well made, it could be somewhat creepy too. So I don't know if you have any examples to share where it was actually well received or the engagement level went up or any of the success criteria. Yeah, we actually do. So for those that may not be aware, we have the entire SNL archive exclusively on Yahoo right now. And one of the things that we do from a programming perspective is look at kind of how do we activate SNL across our network on a daily basis. There's obviously 35 plus years of content that's 
hours and hours, thousands of hours of content, how are we making sure that we are connecting that audience in the right way? So for example, if it's Amy Poehler's birthday and you see a story on the yahoo.com front page, you know, most shared Amy Poehler skit of all time takes you into this web of Amy Poehler, Tina Fey, strong women in SNL, down, down, down. So what we do is we're able to see that personalization funnel really drive engagement and streams and shareability against the content. It's interesting when you were talking about gaming and how gamers want to feel a part of the content. I think that that's also, at the end of the day, everyone's participating in a community and telling stories. So they want to feel like, they're sharing it first, or they're part of the artists, or they're part of the, I think the GIFs have done so much with how people engage with sports and how they're sharing sports. So when you think about personalization on Yahoo, we do see our success increase. The, the, more, um, the more personalized, the more people will just kind of stay in the rabbit hole. So we have seen success where we have a breadth and depth of content, mostly the depth. Anyone else? I'm sure from a music. Yeah, I mean, for, for Vivo on the music side, I mean, it's, it's, it's an area like, it's something where we'll increasingly move, uh, hopefully, towards more and more personalization, more and more customization from a curation perspective. So, you know, for us, it's very much about programming and about, you know, uh, digging into the well of content we have to provide relevance to the user. Um, so, you know, you can, you can sort of opt into that through any number of means today. The more uh, you, information you provide in terms of things like matching up your iTunes library or your Facebook likes or other elements of your social network, we can start pushing and suggesting videos that are hopefully going to be more relevant to you because they match up to those things. Where we're sort of heading in the next iteration of our kind of core products will be, you know, also taking activity um, you know, on a, on a regular basis and customizing, uh, you know, what's, what's presented to you. So we've, we've already moved from sort of a carousel like um, UEX where, you know, we have 10 features a day to more of a feed uh, type of uh, feature where it gives you more reasons to come back hopefully throughout the day, but we're basically kind of pushing new things to you uh, constantly. Like every hour, there's new things available, and they're pushed through to you. But ultimately, if you're you hate country music, you know we shouldn't be pushing the new Brad Paisley video to you. If, but you know, and whatever it is, so that's you know for us that becomes more and more important about how can we make that a customized, personalized experience for you that's just going to be that much more relevant. Also, the the entry touch point just to expand on the music one too. Thinking about social media and how. There is, it becomes an entry point more and more every day. So how are you activating with talent, um, whether it's musicians or creators or casts of shows to really say, hey, we're gonna do a 20 minute Brad Paisley Twitter chat and that's gonna kind of bring in that righteous audience and then how do you make sure you have that personalized funnel for them? That's something that we look at all, all the time and is successful for us. Just one follow up on that. I, any of you guys going out of your network to do a mashup, let's say pull up data from Facebook or Twitter on this guy who's already watching a Webo channel or you know is on Yahoo mm -hmm. and get more information about him or it's mostly within the network the information you have, that's what you use to make the personalization? I mean, we, we definitely do both. I mean, right, provided you know it, the, the user consents to it, we'll you know we'll pull in their Facebook information, we'll pull in their uh, iTunes or Amazon library, uh, we'll pull in you know their uh, their Twitter, um, so we can basically you know uh, look at what their activity is, look at what their friends are doing, and you know program directly to them on that basis. And and to Bonnie's point. We're, we're able to also, you know, work closely with uh, artists and with labels. Um, so, you know, not only are we uh, seeding things through Vivo's own Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr accounts, but we're also able to kind of leverage partnerships with those artists so that they may be the ones who are reaching out to their fan base as well. And, and you know, they're going to have that direct connection. And, and we can, you know, we take advantage of that as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's sort of interesting to see the way all of the access to all of those different sources of data is impacting 
you know, not only online services, but also the networks and moving toward more programmatic ad buying and stuff and everything. So it seems like this is not relegated to any one sector at all. Uh, I think we're exactly at 11.30, so I think that's it. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.